I'd actually love to talk about confidence. You know, I really admire you. I look at you. I'm like, she's an incredible, confident woman, (laughs) even before you started this business in your other life. But do you think confidence is something that you have or don't have? Or is it learned through life experience? I think it's learned through life experience. I, I think that, you know, there are certain people who will go toward challenges And I do believe those who go toward challenges, those who don't back down from challenges, what happens is, is the more challenges you overcome, the more that you realize, oh, that didn't destroy me and that didn't break me down. And that the more confident you become and, and then you begin to, to sort of partner that with, wait a minute, there, there's something much bigger than me out there that is pushing me forward. And okay, I don't know exactly how this whole thing works, but I'm just going to keep running through doors and believe that there is someone that is there that is making sure that those doors open up and and all the rest of that stuff. And so I think it is dual, but I do think that the more challenges you overcome and realize that didn't break me, the more confident you can become. Oh, I love that because I think so many of us will not kind of put ourselves in those challenging situations because it feels uncomfortable, but there's so much breakthrough that happens once you go through it. And it just shows because you've gone through just so much in your own life from your childhood over the years. So you come off as this confident woman, but you've gone through so much. And I love that you also said that there is a higher being. We all know this things always work its way out, you know, in the thick of it, it must feel tough, but you're just like, what is it out there? There must be a higher being to kind of push me through. And you don't know that and you don't have the confidence in that until you put yourself in those situations. So I love everything that you just said. I think it's super important. Without question. And I I always tell people, I said, listen, I don't know what to tell atheists because I have never had, I've never lived in, in a space, in a world in which I didn't believe that there was a God, Hmm. but who it was, I didn't necessarily know. So if yeah. anyone who's agnostic and beyond, we can have a one-on-one. If you, if you don't at least believe, if you somehow believe that we just got here on our own and evolved on our own and all the rest of that, I'm like, okay, I, 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 I don't know what to say there. But if you actually believe as I do, that there is a much greater being that you're able to tap into, the level of confidence when I walk into a room I walk into that room and say, God put me in that room. If I am doing an interview for me, having a conversation with you for an interview is no different than if you were sitting in my house and we were eating fried chicken. It's the exact same. Like I don't have nervousness. If I'm going out in front of 5,000 people to speak, it just is something that I look at and go, okay, I'm about to get on this call or I'm about to go out and speak. And I'm like, all right, Lord, let me rock it. That's it. Like there's no long drawn out. (laughs) It's like, let me rock it. That's it. And then I just go and I, I always rock it. So, (laughs) and I, I I think you just, you just, the more you keep doing it, Mm. a lot of people fear will keep them from doing something. The challenge is, is that if you actually talk to people about the things they are afraid of, they're never actually things that have happened. Mm. They're things they think could happen. So then they allow fear to keep them from getting on the stage or fear to keep them from being interviewed by people like you or all these different fears that over time you just realize, wait a minute, all those different things I used to worry about, be fearful of, they actually never happen. So how about I'm just going to go full speed. And if I run into one of those things I used to be afraid about, I'll become afraid then but I'm not going to do it in advance. Does that, you know what I mean? Yes. So, so it's like, I'm not going to worry about something in advance. If I get to it and find my God, then there, it was really, you know, something here. I probably should have been worried about it. Oh, then I'll worry about it then. <laughs> but I'm not going to worry about it in advance. It will have to happen for me to actually be concerned about it. You're so right. It's funny. I never even thought about that. All those worries that you have, it genuinely, most of the time doesn't happen. So yes, you're right. It it was one of the greatest lessons. I think I learned it when I was somewhere, somewhere in my twenties and it was actually Dale Carnegie's book. And it's called, uh, I think it's stop worrying and start living. And one of the tools that he, he says in there is, and this was during a period of my life where I did worry and I would worry about all kinds of stuff. 
And my husband would always worry about it, whatever. And so I read this book and there was this one thing that resonated and it was write down on a piece of paper, all of the things that you are worrying about right now, those things that you have, that have kept you up, all the rest of that stuff, write every single one down on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, put it in the back of your desk and don't think about any of those things for the next, I think it was like a month or two months or something, and then go back to it. And you go back and you open up the envelope and after having not thought about it, you realize how unrealistic every single one of those worries were. And when you do that over time, you realize everything we worry about, this isn't like a hyperbole or kind of, everything we worry about doesn't actually happen. Gosh. The things, the things that do happen tend to be the stuff we didn't worry about. Yeah, that's true. It's so true, which is actually important in business is what I'm learning. I'm very early in my career, two to three years. You think you're going to worry about A to Z, but really none of that ever happens. It's something from the left field. So you can't even expect it or worry. So you just got to live. Exactly. You just have to go. You have to pursue. And my whole thing is, is that if I'm going to, if I'm going to have a problem, I'll run in the problem and I'll deal with the problem when I run into it but I am not going to forecast a problem and bring it to life. And so I am always going after the pursuit, the solutions, nothing is slowing me down, but it's because I don't have this, this what if tugging on me. Well, what if it happened? This doesn't happen. And what if this doesn't happen? And what if this, I don't have what ifs tugging on me. So when people see me just kind of going for it and they're like, how the hell does she keep hitting all these milestones and breaking history here and there? And like, it's nonstop. It's because I don't allow the what ifs to tug me. I just go. And the what if will have to catch up with me. I'm not going to let it go before me. I love that. And I'm just curious, you know, on the outset, you are breaking all these records. You're doing incredible stuff, even outside of the business. Do you ever have days where you're just like, this is tough or just like you're emotionally maybe a little bit more unstable because of it could be an employee issue or something, but I'm just curious, like, or have you really put together a strong prayer practice or ritual that kind of keeps you pretty level-headed? Both. When I have, there are certain, there are certain days where if I can feel emotion rising in me, one of the, I'm 47 years old. So one of the things I have to acknowledge is my hormones are going to, gonna, they're going to do what they do. Right. Yes, totally. And so one of the things I, I am really, really good about is giving myself space mm. to figure out, is this something real? Is this something that might be hormonal? And once I have pulled back, then I pray and ask for the, the strength, the wisdom, the, the, everything that I need to push through until I'm able to rest that night. And I do, I rest really well. This whole work 20 hours, I think, okay, I did that in my 20s. And <laughs> I had, I felt so proud of myself as a young entrepreneur. I remember the first time I stayed up for 48 hours straight working. I was so proud of myself. Like I was telling everybody and it was a badge I was wearing. And now I'm older and that was one of the dumbest things. I know. So this whole culture of go, 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 don't rest. That's where all the poor decisions in business come from is when you're not rested, you're not clear headed. So you're going to see me rest eight hours a night and you're going to see me have a, a I, I observe the Sabbath, but some people call it a stop day, gap day, whatever you want to call it for 24 hours, I do no work. And so what that allows is that if I do feel that those times where it's like, my gosh, this is a lot, this is a lot. It, and it's, and it's a little bit tiring. The thing that I'll say to myself is you can do anything for the next 72 hours and the Sabbath is in 72 hours. Let's go. And that's, or you can do anything for the next six hours and you get to rest in six hours. Let's push. That's really how I deal with it is that I give myself the space to rest. And when you rest and you renew somehow, some way, the solutions always come forth. And, and so that's, that's how I deal with it. But no, I definitely have a prayer, pray first approach to everything. I love that. And I think I'm so glad you brought up rest because those weeks where I might have that breakdown, it usually happens at the end of the week. And I'm like, 
I'm just exhausted. I pushed a little too hard. I might have not had a good sleep because of whatever might have happened in my life, but it's typically because I feel tired. And I love, love, love that you take Saturday to not work because I think as entrepreneurs, we're so in it. It's part of our life. It's easy for me to go all the time, but to honor that rest, to renew, I think is great. And like you said, whenever you take that break to rest, the solutions come. So I just want to underscore that because I very much believe it. And I needed that reminder from you too. So I appreciate that. And and I should say, I'm not religious on a specific day. Within a seven-day window, I am observing the Sabbath. So that my assistant, one of the things that she does is make sure on any given week, because my week is changing, I'm constantly traveling. And so at the beginning, probably about a couple weeks in advance, she'll say, this is what your schedule looks like on this week. Will your your Sabbath be Saturday, Sunday, or Monday? Mm. We, that is built into my schedule. And it's my, my assistant works with my husband's assistant to make sure that our Sabbath is the same. And sometimes it could be because our schedule is crazy. It could be from three o'clock on a Sunday to three o'clock on a Monday. That's okay. But we shut down. So it's not like a religious, you know, Pharisee kind of thing. Yeah. It's more of a, within a seven day window, we observe rest. And it's, it's always one of the three days on the weekend. Yeah, I love that because some days because of work, you might be going on the weekends that it's okay to not work Monday. And sometimes I catch oh. myself having judgment on myself. Like no. it's Monday and I'm like, but I worked like Monday to Sunday. No, <laughs> yeah, okay. no, you, you have to, that rest wherever you can, wherever you can get it. It's the spirit of the law. I'm not dogmatic when it comes to religion or anything like that. It's the spirit of the law. And the whole purpose of the Sabbath rest is for you. It's to actually rest and to renew. So the idea that you would feel guilty about the day you rest is crazy. So, <laughs> so no, every single week. I mean, my, my assistant, all right, this is, this is your, this is your 24 hours every week. I love that. Well, I want to now jump into your story and I'm going to fast forward a little bit, but what I found so incredible was that before the age of 19, you were in your third homeless shelter, leaving home. And you actually talk about how this was one of the most important times in your life. Can you kind of take us back to that period and share why you found that to be the most impactful? Yeah. Well, first of all, I left when I was, I left home at 15, right? And so I lived in the projects. I lived, you know, this couch, that couch, and then eventually ended up in three separate homeless shelters. And in that period of time, I never broke, right? It isn't, it wasn't, you know, I was broke, but I never broke. There, there was still, I, I knew that I was able to still do something. I wasn't sure what it was, but I would go out and the last place where I stayed, Covenant House, which huge fan of them. And one of the things that they do is every day you go out, you look for a job and they keep an escrow account for you. So a a part of where a lot of my confidence was built was right there is because they, they keep an escrow account for you so that you can go out and get your own place. I think at the time you basically made $5,000 or something, then you would go get your own apartment. And the very first day that I was there, I went out, I did my resume with the counselor that was there. I went out and literally came back with four different jobs. It's, I mean, they're not, they're, they weren't prestigious jobs. It was a hostess at Camacho's Cantina and, and working as a server at BB King's Blues Club. Let's not talk about the fact that I wasn't old enough and they were having a hiring day and clearly did, were like, didn't have time. I was like, Oh, I forgot my ID. No problem. Okay. So just bring it tomorrow. And then the person tomorrow will bring it the next, you know, and I just never brought my ID. But, but my point was, is that I went out and I was able to get these jobs and then I was able to work the jobs with excellence. And, and so very early on, I learned what I may have lacked in formal education, excellence made up for it. And so there's this level of confidence that came with if I do everything with excellence, if I deliver these tortilla chips with this salsa with excellence and make sure that they have everything that they want. And, you know, when you're doing something, a job like that, and, and you're getting tips and people are showing you their gratitude by that. And you're like, wow, I'm actually really good at this. So a lot of people, they look for finding that 
confidence or they look for finding that something in the big job that is yet to come. I found it in those small jobs that I had then and had enormous gratitude that I had those jobs. And, and so for me, that period of time where I would go back to Covenant House and everybody there, the young people there, they were always lamenting, I can't get a job. I can't, you know, and it was a frustrating thing every day. And I was going out and going in between multiple jobs and working two jobs in any given day. So that that for me was a confidence builder for sure. And I'm going to go back a little bit, but you know, you grew up in this very loving family and you mentioned that you were born out of the womb saying no and rejecting, you know, what anyone has ever told you. So maybe we can take it one step before, because obviously our listeners, you know, are like, okay, she was in a homeless shelter. You really stepped out, built your confidence there, but maybe let's go one layer back and kind of talk a little bit about your upbringing. Yeah. My upbringing was my, my mother, my father, my sibling, every, we, incredibly loving household. That was never a question. But as an African-American, until more recently, pretty much the only way we raised kids was authoritarian. And that works for most kids. And then you have some like me <laughs> that have lots of questions and don't go along just because you say, do this, I'm going to ask why. And if your response is because I'm the parent and I said to do it, well, my personality type, I, Myers-Briggs, INTJ, we just don't, we don't just go along with stuff, right? But later in life, I learned that personality type is the most rare for women of, of all personality types. It's point, it's, it's a tiny, tiny percentage, 0.05 or something like that of the population. And so when you are built this way, your parents don't necessarily know what to do with that. So they did the best with the tools that they had. And I think that one of my greatest blessings as in life as an adult is very early on, I think when I was 20, I came to the conclusion that they did the best with what they had. So I did not have any type of uh, anger toward them. I did not wish any type of ill will. I held no bitterness mm. whatsoever. And I think that when you allow that level of grace over other people, the interesting thing is, is you allow that level of grace over yourself. So I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I make a lot of mistakes all the time, but the level of grace I pour on myself is a lot. Wow. Because I also extend grace at the equal level. Oh, that's so powerful. And, you know, you said that you extended grace to your family. And I think what you mentioned, you giving grace to someone, it's just as important for you to give grace to yourself, like for you to genuinely be able to give it to someone. Like you said, you have to give it to yourself. And I love that. You said that kind of came in your 20s. What was that revelation for you? Because so many people don't give grace to themselves even. And I yeah. think that is such a powerful thing to have in our life. So how did you kind of get to that mindset? So when I was 20, 19, 20, somewhere like early 20 or somewhere like that, I tried to commit suicide, not once, but twice. Right. And once I realized I couldn't take myself out, then I came to the conclusion that I'm here for a reason. Mm. I need to figure out what that reason is. And so for six months, I literally just poured Anything that I could into me that was helpful, meaning books. That's how I found out I was INTJ was I read a book called Please Understand Me Too, I think it was. And but literally every book that I thought could be helpful to building me up to be stronger for whatever it was I was purposed to do in the world. And I didn't know what it was, but I had concluded if I tried to take myself out twice and I couldn't, there was a reason. But what I also discovered is when I went back to try to think, why did I try to take myself out? No clue. I, w I mean, like literally no clue. Never had the feeling before, never had the feeling again after. And so I, I think a lot of times just when you're young and we don't give teenagers this grace is to understand there are so many emotions going on. You don't fully know how to express yourself. You're trying to do all these different things. You're failing at a whole lot of things and you don't understand at that point 
that failure isn't the end. Failure mm -hmm. truly is that launch pad for whatever you're going to learn that's for the next level. But when you're 18, 19, 20, you don't know that. And so you're like, look, if it's going to be this hard for the rest of my life, I have no desire. I'm tapping out now. And the fact that I could not tap out, I said, okay, why am I here? What is the reason? And I began, there's um with, with butterflies, when, when the caterpillar is literally going in in order to become a butterfly, it consumes, I think, seven times its body weight. That's basically what I was doing with the reading. It was nonstop. The only two things I did was, was work and read, work and read, because I wanted to fill myself up with information of those who had come before me and who were wiser than me. And I learned a lot. And I'm still that way. If you came into my office now, it's absurd the amount of books that <laughs> I still to this day am constantly filling myself with those who have greater wisdom than mm -hmm. I do because they have been here already for much longer. And, and that's, that's helpful. What I don't pay attention to is social media and th the folks who are currently like they, they just discovered stuff yesterday. Those are, I don't, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I, that's what I don't pay attention to is I'm looking at the Titans of the 19th century, the mm -hmm. early 20th century, the, the Carnegie's, the Mellons, the Rockefellers, the DuPonts. Those are the folks, the Benjamin Franklin's, those are the folks who I've studied and said, okay, they all hit up against walls. How did they overcome it? How did they deal with challenges? How did they resolve this? Those are the kind of things that I've been, I've been studying. And I think that when you have looked at other successful Titans that have overcome insurmountable challenges, your challenges aren't that big. Like they just aren't. Totally. And I mean, even a small version of that with this podcast, you know, hearing your story, hearing women, you know, I've done 300 interviews almost and any hardship that comes in my business, I'm like, this is nothing compared to what this person went through. And, and even when you did go through that hardship, they always made it on, on the other side. So hearing inspirational stories has been so powerful for me. So just to see that you continue to honor that, educate yourself, follow those people. I think it's just so important with your mindset. And one question that I think is interesting, you know, and I'm curious, maybe this was a little bit early in your life. I think boundaries are important also with people. Like I'm sure maybe you had family members or friends as you were kind of turning into that butterfly who didn't serve this new life phase that you were in. But any advice to anyone who's listening who kind of might be in there and say, you know what, maybe my friend kind of pulls me down or my ex-boyfriend. I mean, what, whoever that could be. Yeah. So butterflies don't eat what's caterpillars they're not hanging out on the ground eagles you will see in the sky you are not going to see them walking around on the so so you have to look at it and say what do i want to be where do i want to be and that that becomes difficult because you do have to make the decision to pull back here's the thing though there are a lot of people that came up with me over that period of time, I didn't hard, I didn't cut any of them off. And I know that that's kind of a thing for a lot of people now, cut them off. I didn't. I just distanced myself in such a way that they themselves began looking for other relationships. So I didn't create any hard line breaks. I simply became unavailable most of the time. And what that allowed is, is that there's no animosity in me. There's nothing in me. So if I run into you, I can give you a hug. I can ask you, how's everything going and all the rest of that stuff. There's no negativity there. However, I've outgrown you and that's okay. We outgrow our toys. We outgrow our beds. We outgrow our first apartment. We outgrow throughout life, everything. Why would we think we wouldn't outgrow people? It's okay to outgrow them. And, but it doesn't mean you have to literally have some kind of breakup or some kind of argument. You just simply are more interested in new things because you're a new creature. You've evolved. And if they haven't evolved with you, that's okay. Find a group that is evolved. That is where you're. So my friend group now 
we can sit around and have conversations all on the same level because we've all evolved to where we are. And the people who I evolved away from, I see them and it's, it's pure joy. How are you? How are your kids? How are your, but that, but that's it. We don't, we no longer have that connection. And so you can only allow someone to pull you down. If you have something, you allow them to hold on to, let it go. Whatever it is that they're holding on to, let it go. And that's it. I love that. The distancing of people. And then also it's okay to outgrow different relationships. Like you said, you outgrow apartments, you outgrow jobs. Like it's such a normal part of life. So I love that. Every bit of growth, every living organism. I don't care if you're talking about a leaf, a tree, our growth requires us to move on from something. Spring doesn't come unless winter goes. Winter doesn't come unless fall goes. And it's, you know, I, every single time, not every time, but a lot of times when it rains here in Tennessee, I'll do a video and I'll post it on my stories on IG to remind people The reason my whole, you know, 20 acre backyard is green, beautiful trees, gorgeous leaves. I don't have sprinklers. It's because there is a consistent rain that comes before the sun. Mm. If you run away from the rain, if you don't want rain, what you end up with is desert. So people don't understand. They're hopeful for all these days of sunshine And it really impacts them when those days of rain come. But you have to understand that's the part that keeps it green. This whole greener on the other side type of thing. No, no. What keeps it green are the challenges that come. That rain, that's what keeps it green. The sunshine will also come. It'll come afterwards. But you have to embrace those moments where it rains. And I've I've gotten quite good at that in life. Oh, I love so beautiful with the analogy. I love that fawn. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit and kind of talk about this vacation you were having in Asia where you came across an article of Jack Daniels and Uncle Nearest, you know, unknowing to you at the time, you had no idea that that moment would be, you know, such a pivotal moment in your life. So can you take us back to that time and really share what the article was saying and what it really sparked for you at the moment. Yeah. So the article was a New York times. It was the international edition. I was in Singapore and the cover was, uh, had a, a, a white man who I was familiar with his face. I didn't drink the product, but I was familiar and it's Jack Daniels. And I was familiar because there's really only three photos of him ever in his whole lifetime. I think maybe two. Oh, really? <laughs> sketches. Yeah. He's, he is even as big of a PR person as he was. He, he didn't have photos. It literally, you see a bunch of people sketching with the hat, without the hat, with the beard, without the beard. But it's if you really look at it, same photo. And so I, I was familiar with the photo. And in this particular photo, Jack is surrounded by his leadership team. Everyone is white. But the person to the immediate right of him who he cedes the center position to is a black man. And I'm looking at this photo and the, the, the header, the title of the article was Jack Daniel embraces a secret ingredient, help from a slave. And so I'm in Singapore looking at this news. And as at the time I was 39, I was about to turn 40. Up until that point, there wasn't a single ubiquitous American brand that I could point to and say, my ancestors were there at the beginning. Now we all know that there's plenty patents, trademarks, things that have happened in throughout the course of our country's history, plenty of businesses, plenty of products that we were there at the beginning, but we can't prove it. And so here you're looking at this photo and going, who's that black man? And if this is true, and we can prove it, it changes everything. Because now we're creating a blueprint for how to go back and give us credit for things that we were there at the beginning of. And and so this for me, I got excited immediately, just kind of diving into the story. My husband calls them my rabbit holes. (laughs) And I do it every Sabbath. This is not a new thing. Like every Sabbath, at least a few of my hours, are spent diving into a rabbit hole over something random. This past weekend, I'm not kidding you, was how long have humans lived? I love it. So I go, (laughs) 
So I'm literally looking this up, looking, when did the first Homo sapiens come? When did the modern Homo sapiens come? I'm like, babe, well, how old do you think humans are? And, you know, he's going back to Christ and going back a little while before that. And he's like, I don't know. What do you think? 2,700 years? And it was like, how about 300,000? He's like, what? And so I start reading this. So this is very normal for for me. I go into these rabbit holes where I just love random information. And so that rabbit hole of who was this black man and was he instrumental to the start of Jack Daniel, that became my rabbit hole. The difference is, is I usually go into a rabbit hole for a few hours. I come out of the rabbit hole. I'm still in that rabbit hole. So knee deep in this rabbit hole. And I, I, I love it here. I don't know that I'll ever get out of this rabbit hole because I keep hiring more historians and, and, and genealogists, and we just keep digging and finding more layers and more layers. And, and I don't know that that will stop. Wow. I just have goosebumps hearing that because it is a rabbit hole that you're in fully and that's now your whole life. But so much of how you even landed and started this company were, I don't know if you would say it's like a divine being because there were so many serendipitous yeah, moments, right? Yeah, so, so maybe in the early days, can you share? I know one of the ones was purchasing the the acres of land in Tennessee. So maybe you can kind of walk through that story. Yeah, it's it's the craziest thing because we we I decided I wanted to go to Lynchburg and see if the story was true. This is what I wanted to do for my 40th birthday. Instead of being on a computer in a rabbit hole, I actually wanted to go to <laughs> the place where, where the rabbit hole began. And, and so my husband and I went to, to Lynchburg and we weren't there for, but a couple of hours before I found out that the book that I read that really brought me, there is a book called Jack Daniel's legacy. It was written in 1967, height of the civil rights era. And you have nearest green, which is the African-American now, now we know is the first known African-American master distiller, the teacher of Jack. Jack's first master distiller and the African-American man that was in that photo that I referenced is nearest his son, George. We now know that at the time we did not. And so I'm going there. We're not there, but for a couple of hours. And we learn that the place where nearest was the master distiller, where Jack moved as a very young boy, then became orphaned, learned how to make the whiskey from nearest and where the original Jack Daniel distillery is, was, and where the original distillery number seven, that is the, that is the only location where there was distillery number seven. So we find all this out in research, but what we learned from the book was nearest taught Jack at this location, the Dan call farm. And this is where Jack grew up. This is where nearest lived. Well, it was for sale and it had been for sale for 18 months. Now, everybody knew that that is where Jack grew up. That's where he learned how to make whiskey. And by all accounts, that's where his first whiskey partnership was. So everyone knew that. Now, my research revealed that's where the original Jack Daniel distillery was. But they, at the very least, knew his first partnership distillery was there. And this property, 313 acres, with the original home where Jack grew up, where the whole second floor was a time capsule, because the prior owner was afraid their daughter would fall out of the balcony. So they closed off the second floor. Literally, it was a time capsule from the 19th century. And 18 months, <laughs> like that is absolute insanity. But what became clear is that property was meant for us to have. It was meant to be the foundation of the story. It was meant to be where I did the majority of my research. I would go all over the country and bring back research to that house and allow the story to come alive in that house. But that house shouldn't have been available. It it absolutely shouldn't have been available. And we were in the middle of a, uh, a quite a difficult investment deal. We had put in about $2 million to some investors and we knew we were about to lose all of it. Here's the thing. Founders can be very interesting right? They can either really cause a business to fly, but they can also kill a business. And we were watching founders kill a business with our money. This is separate outside of 
anything in time, separate business. Completely separate, having nothing to do with it. The wow. only reason I was in Singapore is because I was just trying to get a break from dealing with that situation and going, I don't know how to resolve it. I don't think it can be resolved. And so Keith was going to Singapore on a business trip. I literally tagged along at the last minute just to clear my head. And so by the time we got to Lynchburg, we learned that this particular property, that the owner would give it a discount of about a half a million dollars if we offer cash. It's a Southern thing. I still don't understand it because <laughs> whether it's through a mortgage or through a cash, it's all, it all goes into your account the same. But for some reason, an offer here in cash, it resonates a lot more. And so we, we made the offer in cash. But my husband and I looked at each other and said, we don't have the cash. We're pouring all of our money into this. But that in and of itself and how it worked out was another thing that let us know, okay, this right here, this is where you're supposed to be. There's something here and it was set aside for you. So dive in. And, and that's what I did. Yes. And so you bought this property. You were still doing all this research on the history. At what point were you like, oh, there's a business opportunity here and, and kind of start with whiskey? Because as so many people know, like the liquor industry is so tough, oh, full of true. conglomerates, and especially as someone who doesn't have that background. I'm just curious how the whiskey aspect kind of came about. Oh, we'd have to be here another I know. hours, right? I but know. The, the bottom line is, is that one thing led to another where we just kept moving forward. We didn't do the what ifs. We didn't do the, you know, fear of, well, what if this doesn't work out? That doesn't work out. We just kept moving forward. I was writing a book, which is now written and we're, we're doing the editing part, but I began with a book and a movie in mind. But as we were here, it became clear that what was supposed to come first is what would actually cement the legacy of the first known African-American master distiller. Can't do that with a book. You can't do that with a movie. The only reason we're still talking about Johnny Walker, Jim Beam, Jack Daniel is because we're still looking at their bottles everywhere we go. And so it became really clear that the only way that we bring nearest into the conversation and he remains there for every future generation is we had to make him a part of the culture, overall culture, not anyone's particular culture, all cultures. And that was, that was absolutely the only way we were going to do this story justice. And so that's where the transition, that's where the pivot happened. But at that time, the only thing we really had was a story and we had to learn everything else. We are complete outsiders. The people who I brought to work alongside me, outsiders, I had no, like literally one person with industry knowledge and it was just on the whiskey production side, everything else we had to figure out. And in this industry, the most powerful group is the distributor. We knew nothing about distributors. We didn't know how they tick. We didn't know how to. So there was a massive learning curve, but I was okay with that because it, I was really clear it was what I was supposed to be doing. And I, I'm trying to see if I remember this correctly, but I know, you know, some of the hardships in the beginning to get this off the ground. Was it there like one case where you had to get your husband on a call because they weren't listening to you or what was yeah. that? So my whole, my whole leadership team are women. Still is I to love it. Still is to this day. This industry, when we came into it, we've changed it a lot. Our presence, our success has changed it a lot. But when we first came in, there were no women in high level roles within any of the spirit companies. And by high level, I mean, CEO, president, chief business officer type of thing, chief there were, there were no, no COOs that were women. And so the, the people in this industry weren't used to women being on the other line. And so my, my first three, the three of us, it was myself, our head of whiskey operations and my, at the time, she's not my chief business officer, but at the time she was my senior vice president of sales and marketing. We realized that we had all these phone calls that we were making and no one's returning the phone calls. And so I said to them, I said, send me every person who you've been trying to reach. And these, these were people that were important for us to be able to get this business off the ground. We're talking about distributors, bottle makers, those who you have to coming into it, source product, source whiskey, all the rest of the stuff. 
We couldn't get anyone to return the phone calls. I said, I want to just test something out. I want to test out a theory. Just give me a synopsis of every person, the contact information, and I'm going to forward it all to Keith. So Keith got this long list of people that we had been trying to reach literally for weeks on, on some for over a month that we were getting no return phone calls. And I said, babe, can you call all these people? Tell them you started Uncle Nearest and these are the things you need from each person that you talk to. And he thought it was funny because he said it was basically Remington Steel all over again. It's like, yeah, Remington Steel. But the, the interesting thing was every phone call that he made, he either got through immediately or he got a call back by the end of the day. And at some point during that conversation, they would say, hey, do you, do you like beer? You want to go grab a beer? Do you golf? You want to go golf? So it was a bros type of thing. And I think in their mind, they wouldn't think we're trying to, to lock out women. In their mind, they're just trying to connect with more bros. Whatever the case may be, the thing that I love about how I have conditioned myself to progress is it didn't bother me at all. Not for two seconds was I bothered by it. The moment I realized what it was, then I knew the solution. That's all I cared about. So for the longest time, if you look at when Uncle Nears first began, I did interviews every single day. If you look at any interview I did in 2017, 2018, maybe even up to the beginning of 2019, I was never founder and CEO. I was chief historian. I was telling the brand story from the historical standpoint, but I never put myself out there as being the person who ran the company. So much so that people assumed my husband, who, by the way, is an executive vice president for Sony Pictures, he don't have time to be running a damn whiskey company, but it was easier for them to wrap their head around him being able to do that as a side gig than it was for me to be able to do it as a full-time gig. Oh my gosh. And, and so for the longest time, as people, as I began getting out there more and more, and they would tell my husband, your wife's a great marketer. <laughs> and he'd go, she's more than that, but okay. And I, and I would just, because he knew I wasn't bothered by it, he was able to just do what he could do to support the company. But what it allowed my team and me to do is to fly completely under the radar as we built a company in an industry in which no person of color has ever succeeded as a founder and CEO ever. So I actually am really, really grateful that that happened because we were just building under the radar until such time that we had grown to a place that I couldn't be under the radar anymore. <laughs> I stayed under the radar the whole time. And then one day everyone woke up and said, wait, she's the one behind this? <laughs> I love yeah, it. That would be me. Oh my, building under the radar. No, that's amazing. And once you kind of broke into the distributors, I mean, you guys were doing well before you were quote unquote, the face of the business. How did you create awareness for the brand? So even if it's in the stores, like you guys had such incredible success, like what would you say are maybe some of the attributes of that? I, well, first of all, we understood very early on, we could not compete with the conglomerates. They were going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. And there's a reason that every independent spirit brand that has come into this industry has either failed or been sold. The industry is set up to force you to fail or to sell. It always has been. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But the bottom line is, it is what it is. I understood that going into it. So one of the first things I did was reject anything that anyone said in terms of how I should do it. You should only go into one state and build from there. You should not go into more than two states, but I told my Kate, my now CBO, I want to be in all 50 states within the first two years. That had never been done by an independent. Sure as hell hadn't been done by an independent of, with a, a person of color, with an all woman leadership team. And every person who she mentioned it to were like, that's impossible. You at, at best, you can get into 26 states. There's no, and that's at best. That's the best we've ever seen happen. And I said, no, we're going to get into all 50. And the reason why all 50 was important is because the only way that we could level the playing field is if we were out there telling the story nonstop in the press. Well, if I'm on the Today Show and CBS This Morning and Good Morning America and all the rest of that, I'm talking to a national audience. 
if the national audience can't get Uncle Nearest, it's a waste of a very precious commodity, which is the press. And so getting into every market very early on was always a part of the or like top of mind original goal. The other thing is, is that I noticed that people would win awards. They would promote, I got a gold award. I got this award. And you couldn't really distinguish the difference between this gold award, this double gold award. And, and so I came to the conclusion, it didn't really matter that much to the consumer. However, if we became the most awarded, that would make a difference. And so from the very beginning, before we ever went into the market, we made sure our product was excellent. I mean, excellent, excellent, excellent. But then we submitted it to every single competition there was. We weren't going after a gold. We were going after every gold. And it was the first time. Now you see brands say most awarded tequila and all the rest. But that that came from us. That <laughs> God bless really? them. That's a straight up copycat. That never existed before us. And, and now you see it a lot. But we are and remain the most awarded bourbon and American whiskey. So that includes rye and everything else of 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. And we are so far ahead in 2023. There's absolutely no way that anyone catches up with us. There's not enough competitions left to catch up with us. And so when you're looking at a strategy, those three things, we had determined out the gate, we are going to do this. We're going to become the most awarded. We're going to be in every in all 50 states within within two years. And we're going to build this entire thing, leveling the playing field by sharing the story every day, all day, and never getting tired of doing it. And it just shows the benefits of sometimes being out of the industry to be more unique and creative, right? Because so many people don't even allow themselves to jump into something. I'm like, it could be your biggest competitive advantage. So I love that you kind of came at it at a different angle. And I'm curious, you know, obviously this was not cheap. What did it look like raising money early on to kind of get that first phase of the business out? Were people receptive to you? Was that tough? How was that experience? It was really tough. And, uh, and out the gate, it was a it was a massive challenge because remember our story the story of nearest green is right smack dab in the middle of the story of jack daniels and at the time their parent company is a 24 billion dollar company and we're nobody with very little resources to work off of so any person who we're pitching are like no way all they have to do is, is point their lawyers at you they will literally have you bogged down in paperwork until this thing disappears. So it was a massive risk. And I really had to walk people through all the things that had happened, like the farm being available or like all the just the different things that just happened that made it really clear that I was supposed to be doing it. But more importantly, what I learned very early on most investors don't invest in a business. They invest in the founder. And if they believe that that founder will not go down without giving the fight of their life, they will risk, even if it's a great risk. And so I wasn't pitching the business. I was pitching me. I was absolutely certain I was meant to do this. And I was absolutely certain no matter what roadblock came in my way, what challenge came in my way, I would not give up. And if I had to spend the rest of my life paying them back because I lost their money, that's what I would do because this was worth it. And once I had the first investor that put in a half a million dollars, then that investor led me to other investors that all put in between 250 and 500,000. So that first raise were all connected to the very first investor. And that's the part that a lot of people raising money don't get. And, and I share this often. They think that they need this massive network in order to be able to raise money, or they need to have all these people that they have to pitch. That's not true. You need one believer because there's not investors run in packs, all of them, because that's how they do deal flow. That's how they get their deals. And so you're not looking for 
50 investors. You're calculating it in your head and saying, in order for me to get this done, I need this many investors to put in this much. And it becomes so overwhelming that people give up. They just don't even try. But if you actually think about what you need, you only need one. That one who will truly believe in you because that one is connected to another one who's connected to another one who's connected to another one. The entire network started with one person. I love that. And I'm curious, I'm sure that Doc, Jack Daniels risk was big for investors. Did that ever pan out in any way? Or how did you create comfort there? Because that's a big deal, especially as someone who's at the time was your brand was nothing. It wasn't even out yet. It was one hell of a chess game. <laughs> I, I will. I Another will podcast that. for that. The detail, I, I, I actually finally added it to the, it's in the book. Oh, I'm excited. It was, okay. It, it, uh, it was one hell of a chess match and I had to believe in myself that yes, they're bigger. Yes, they have more money, but if this is what I am purposed to do, nothing can take me out. Mm -hmm. so this goes back to post suicide number two, right? Or attempt. If I can't take me out, nobody can take me out. I took that approach with this, that I am not going to let them take me out. We're going to get this done. And so we're there, we're there days where it's like, oh crap, if they do this and I do this and they do this and they like where you're literally looking at how this could potentially play out. Absolutely. It could have been, it could have been very difficult, but that's the nature of massive reward. You're not going to find a single person who has built something of any real level of success that did not come so close to failure yeah. that they did not see how they could get to the success, but it was literally right there. Mm -hmm. And that is, I remember not long, actually just last year, I was at an event where Elon was, Elon Musk was speaking and he was talking about the fact that at one point with Tesla, he was doing a series D. And if he had not closed that series D on that Friday, every paycheck on that Monday was bouncing. That's a normal story for most entrepreneurs. Unless you came from money, that is your story. Every single time I go to do a raise, I wait until the very last minute until I absolutely have to, because I'm always convinced that I can build the valuation more by the sure. next month and the next month. And so I don't want to have to raise until I absolutely have to. Well, that can be really scary if you're a scary person. But entrepreneurs who have been successful, that's the only way we know how to do it. Is you're you've come to a point of thinking this thing is going to end multiple times. Like it feels like that, right? And but it's always right on the other side. And it's the the difference between success and failure is just simply not giving up. And there's something about that not giving up. Success somehow finds you every single time that you don't give up. Man, and that's why I just think it's so important to even start doing that in your life in a small scale, right? And then you kind of build that. Exactly. I don't, yeah, like purpose, conviction, the stress. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is your cup is much bigger to handle these larger risks, Absolutely. quote unquote, right? Absolutely. Well, because when you look at the different things that you've tried, and they didn't work, but you look at it and, and you look at the lessons you gleaned from it and you take that with you to the next thing and you take it with you, then you stop being afraid of failure because you're looking for the gym in all of it. Okay. There's a gym in this, in this hole. There is, there is that, there is something in that. And that's what I'm looking for. So it may be, you know, not beautiful on the outside and it may not look great on the outside, but I'm looking for what's in the middle of that. And the more times you quote unquote fail, the easier it becomes for you to just go after it because you realize that wasn't actually a failure. I just carried it forward that lesson. And I'm, what I'm doing now is a culmination of all of my past quote unquote failures. Every gym that I picked up from everything that I, I gave up on, mm. but I, I took the gyms with it. And, and that's, and that's where I am now. And so you could not pay me to give up no matter how challenging, no matter how difficult. And in this industry that is literally built 
for independence to fail or to be forced to sell. There are always days that you're coming up against something that seems insurmountable. And you just have to remember, I've already overcome the insurmountable so many times. This is just another time. Let's get to it. I love that. And your mindset of there's always a gem in this. So if you're in a situation or a difficult time, it's like having that mindset of what am I going to learn from this? What's the gem? That's just such a healthy mentality to have throughout all this. And also the purpose that you have that's outside of yourself, which we started the interview with really is pushing you. So I think if anyone's like wanting to start a business, it's always like, what's your bigger mission and why? Because a product might change. The days might be tough. And it's like, you need that overarching mission to push you, right? You <laughs> must begin with the why. If you begin with the what, you will fail. Mm -hmm. You must begin with the why. Why are you doing it? So for me, I'm going to cement the legacy of Nearest Green, but that why has evolved. Once I learned there has never been a, a person of color to successfully found and own and run a spirit company, it became, I need to create the blueprint for the one who will come behind me and I need to pull as I climb and I need to show them that they can do this no matter how challenging it is. And so my why, my original why remains cementing the legacy of nearest green, but I've added on to that why of pulling as I climb. And as, as time goes on, the why will continue to build and to continue to evolve. But everything I do goes back to the why. Nothing goes back to the what. So inspired by you, Fauna. And I'm so excited about your book because I feel like I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> tell us more about the book, when we should look out for it, because I feel like everyone's going to want to just learn more about you because you're just such an inspiration to so yeah, many. Yeah, it comes out. It actually, we actually just chose a date for it. It comes out on June 18th and it's called love and whiskey you can't find it anywhere i mean like it's not like i'm pre-ordering or anything like that we literally just chose the date but the book is done and now we're just doing back and forth final edits and the team that i have on it editing and and the research and this is it, it's one of those things where the book in and of itself is fantastic but the index that makes sure that everybody knows you will never be able to disprove the story of Nearest Green. This one is here to stay. So for those who didn't like it, get used to it. <laughs> I love it, Fod. Well, I am so excited for you guys. Congrats on that. Thank you for being with us today. It was truly such an honor. I so appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate you.